I wanted to just give a little background on why we're having this talk. Um, I thought it would be, I, how to frame it. I think SPC in the past has been very good at um, developing people's individuality and being like, hey, here is this thing, whatever you're working on, we're gonna help you do it, you know, twice as well, 10 times as well. Um, but there, there hasn't been a lot of, you know, um, maybe thinking about different directions to work on or, or you know, we, we don't like push people in different directions very much, um, but we do have a few kind of sub communities um, that are pretty cohesive. You know, there's, there's certainly this like founder community, which is um, a lot of support resources for helping people become better founders. There's kind of this machine learning AI sub community where there's enough critical mass there that there's kind of institutional knowledge and if people come in and they're like, hey, I wanna get more into this space, um, we can you know, help them in that direction. Um, but an area that I felt like we didn't have a lot of you know, momentum for was this, this sort of social impact space. So if people come in and they're like, hey, I wanna do something meaningful in the world. I wanna do something that, that you know, helps the wider, um, the wider world. There hasn't been a lot of, um, I guess, institutional experience or um, resources or even like sub communities groups focused on that. So I thought it would be good to, to kind of have a talk to start this discussion. Um, and so today we have Danielle Graham, who is the managing director at Founders Pledge, who's going to be um, really awesome at kind of just like starting this conversation. So we're going to hear about Founders Pledge. Um, we're going to kind of talk more about effective altruism in general, kind of like, what does that mean? What does that mean for people in our community? Um, and then think about um, specifically in SBC, what are some ways that we can um, keep this conversation going and, and support people working on these kind of things. So in terms of, of structure of the conversation, the first 15, 20 minutes, um, I have a few questions for Danielle to just kind of like lay the groundwork and, and introduce the topic. Um, and then I'll open, open the floor to questions from anyone for the next 20 minutes or so. And then for the last 20 minutes, I thought it'd be useful if we kind of had like a, a SPC only discussion to um, talk about takeaways from what we heard from Danielle, and then also talk about how can we um, in SPC continue this conversation? Um, where do we go from here? How do we kind of build a sub community of people that support each other on these kind of social in initiatives? Um, so that's kind of like thirds that I'm thinking about how we'll, we'll split this hour into. Um, okay, so let me get started. Thank you so much for joining us, Danielle. Um, to start off, can you just give us a little bit of background on yourself, kind of how did you get involved in EA, um, what brought you to Founders Pledge, and what is your role there now? Yeah, happy to. So really excited to be with you guys and mostly interested to hear what you're thinking about. So in our conversation part, I know there's so many paths you could go from how you're, you're working on the ventures you're working on now. Uh, do you want to become someone who donates? Do you want to be someone who uses your influence to help drive social change. So I'm looking forward to just hearing kind of where are you coming from so we can shape the discussion in that way. Um, to just share a little bit about myself. So I have been in the social change space nearly my entire life. So I started my first nonprofit when I was 15 years old, uh, doing kind of political activism. My second when I was 16 that has become a big global organization working with children around the world. Um, from my learnings from doing kind of a grassroots advocacy work, I wanted to become much more scientific in how I approach humanitarianism and nonprofit work in general. So I, I spent a phase of my career working in uh, the think tank space, and I went to Harvard and, and was a frontline humanitarian as well. Um, also worked at a really big foundation. So I was the head of Tony Blair's foundation, the former prime minister of England. And I found my way to Founders Pledge because through a variety of experiences, either being on the side of a foundation where uh, I was helping to energize people to donate their money to a cause and learning through that experience, sometimes hearing people who uh, had really good intentions about how, what they were hoping their money would achieve, but actually some of the things that they were funding ended up being so far from driving the impact that they really intended. And then also having the experience of sometimes meeting with, with donors who really uh, weren't asking 
thoughtful questions about what their, their dollars were going to achieve. I really wanted to help focus on that problem of how do we actually make sure that the billions of dollars that flow each year to philanthropic causes are actually making a real difference. And so that's why I came to Founders Pledge. Um, just briefly, Founders Pledge is an organization that its mission is to empower entrepreneurs to do immense good. Um, there are kind of two pieces of that mission that matter to us. So one is the entrepreneurs. We define quite broadly. So we're a community for founders, investors, early employees, people broadly in the startup ecosystem. Um, why? Because people in tech are already proven problem solvers. So in your day to day, you're thinking about problems that exist in society and you're creating solutions to address those problems. The world's biggest problems today require people who, who really have kind of design thinking in how they're addressing those problems. And so we believe that in gathering a community that's uniquely skilled in the tech background, that we're not only going to be able to have more impact through philanthropy, but actually we're going to bring together a group that can found the next companies together, that can you know, impact invest together, that can really change the game by working collaboratively. Um, the second piece of our mission that really matters is that immense good piece. So we're part of a broader community that Zach mentioned, um, a kind of philosophical movement called effective altruism. Effective altruism essentially is trying to maximize our impact of any resources that we're investing in something. So that could be your time. So where do you invest your time so that you can have, do the very most social good? It could be your philanthropy, which is the piece you know, Founders Pledge is focused on, helping people donate to do the very most good. And it applies rationality and evidence to try to figure out how do you make trade-offs between this and that. So we're part of this broader philosophical movement. We're also not, uh, we don't describe ourselves as the exclusively effective altruist. So what that means is we take what we see as some of the best components of effective altruism to help us think through the trade-offs between, you know, focusing on climate change versus focusing on uh, homelessness in San Francisco. And if someone has a hundred thousand to give, you know, how do you decide what portion to give where? And we, we think that that's a tool set that really is useful. Um, so I'm happy to, to dig in further across the board on either how to use your resources for good as a donor, how to use your time for good. Um, and it's very exciting to be with you guys and also be on this journey in general, maximizing impact with folks in tech. Thank you so much. Um, and just to, um, just to say, if anyone wants to jump in with questions, we'll have more discussion later, but also feel free to jump in, just raise your physical or virtual hand and I'll try to, um, I'll try to notice that. Um, Danielle, can you tell us a little more, maybe in detail about Founders Pledge? What, um, who specifically do you work with? Um, what have, you know, some of your biggest successes been? Um, what have some of your struggles been maybe? Um, just kind of like getting a little more into the details of, of your experience with, with that organization specifically. Yeah, absolutely. So just briefly, why does it exist? Well, we exist to help people who have an intention to do good through the, the companies they're creating, actually firm up that commitment into a, a real commitment. So that's the pledge. And then we exist to actually help people have the most impact they can. So that's through the community that we gather, the programming that we have, the, the connecting we do within our community. Um, we have an advisory team that helps our members explore op opportunities to give as well as opportunities to uh, do good. And we have a research team that's assessing really high impact places to invest their funds. Um, we've tried to make the entire Founders Pledge system end to end and really design for the entrepreneur so that people can join us early in their entrepreneurial journey um, while they're building their companies and then know that when the time comes and you actually have you know, an exit event and you are suddenly needing to make a lot of decisions for your own personal uh, financial management that we're there to help you think through those decisions um, and optimize for, for tax and optimize for you know, all the ways that you might be thinking about your giving. Um, so we do also offer a, a donor advice fund at, at Founders Pledge that really makes it end to end so that you can, um, when the time comes to actually donate, have infrastructure that's set up and that's shared amongst our members. Um, and, and maybe can you tell us a little more about like what those pledges look like, like for if, if there's any founders in the audience that maybe are, are wondering what that would look like, you know, hey, I'm a founder, when do I, when should I think about giving this pledge um, and, and what, you know, is it binding, all that kind of stuff. Yep. So, um, and I'll, I'll talk about founders pledge, but also just to let you know about 
other tools that exist. So a useful thing about Founders Pledge is that it is a personal giving pledge. So it's not, there are other pledges that exist that are corporate giving pledges. All of these options can be powerful tools to help you embed an intention to have social good be a part of your company uh, and, and really make that a reality. The difference with a personal giving pledge is that you don't need anyone else's permission to take it. Um, so you alone can say from the beginning of your company's formation that you are going to want to uh, set aside a portion of your eventual proceeds if you are so lucky as to, you know, to come into an exit um, and set that aside for charity. So you're able to get involved in Founders Pledge. Series B plus is really our target. If you're interested earlier than that, just let us know. Um, and there's ways that you can get involved even before you're kind of a, at a Series B phase. Um, what you're pledging to is you're choosing a percentage of your own eventual personal proceeds that you would like to set aside for charity. It's a charity full stop. So there's no requirements at this point in making any decisions about where it goes. You can make all those decisions later. Um, we have a minimum to join the community, which is 5%. Um, and our community tends to be quite generous. So our average is closer to 15%. Um, but it, you know, we have folks all across the, the spectrum there and how they pledge. This is like proceeds from your personal um, income, right? Not the company equity. Yeah, it's not company equity. It's not even income. So this is, it's a very specific wording, which is you're pledging a percentage of exit proceeds. So if you sell your company or your company IPOs, what percentage of your exit proceeds do you want to pledge to give to charity? So it's basically, we've tried to make it really simple. So you're not having to do annual calculations. It's off the cap table. You don't need anyone else's permission. It's just your personal proceeds. Tamina? Free tax? So that's actually how you, the fulfillment of the pledge is up to you, how you assess it. We recommend that you're taking the value pre-tax um, just because it means more to charity. But uh, ultimately, when we're, when we're kind of comparing your stated pledge to your actual pledge value that's goes to charity is a, on an individual basis and working with your tax advisors as well. Any more questions about the, the pledge specifically there? Is it legally binding? It is. So Founders Pledge is a legally binding pledge. Um, and that's really meant to, to try to make it something that people take seriously. So we don't want people taking the pledge and then not actually seeing it through. Um, we don't, you know, we've never gone to court over a pledge. We don't intend to. So it is a one page document. It's very simply worded, um, you know, technically legally binding, but not something that we're actively enforcing. Hmm. Cool. Um, okay. So I wanted to, to kind of think about, so we have two different groups at SPC. We have our founders or kind of entrepreneurs or people who have some intention of, Hey, I'll probably start a company at some point maybe at SPC, that's kind of what I'm here for, thinking about what my thing is gonna be or trying to launch it. And then we have um, domain experts who are people who have no desire or intention to start a company, but you know, wanna have impact in, in whatever their domain is. Um, so I wanna think about these two groups. Uh, we've talked about the founders pledging specifically. Um, maybe the other side of, of founders would be founders who um, want to have more direct impact with their companies. Maybe they're starting nonprofits or maybe their, their company, you know, is just intended to have some, some impact. Um, I was wondering if there's maybe what, what would you in the, in the whole EA or like that general space, uh, what would be resources for those specific, that specific group of people? Yeah. So the, a great question we talked a bit about the other day is, um, if you're finding yourself in a position of wondering, how should I actually use my time? I could invest my time in building as successful as a company as possible um, and trying to essentially optimize for wealth generation as well in that. And I have an eye, still have an eye towards being as impactful as possible. There is a really legitimate case to be made for, you know, absolutely focus on building the biggest, best business you possibly can and do that to the ultimate degree and then know that there are ways that you can invest your resources if and when you have them that are as high impact as possible. And when you think about this, and this is very much a philosophical question that effective altruism uh, informs, you can think about this quite quantitatively. Um, a, if, if you enter the nonprofit sector and you're a single individual, you might 
say make 30 grand, 50 grand, depending on the position, um, but you'd be, you'd be taking a position that is not optimized for wealth generation. Um, and you'd be doing a specific kind of role description that is you know, tied to whatever the mission of your organization is. Alternatively, if you are so fortunate as to find yourself in a position that someday you have a significant exit, you could have the resourcing to invest that would be equivalent to hundreds or thousands of the salaries of someone who has entered the nonprofit space. So the case, you know, the, the effective altruist kind of case for why would you do what, what effective altruism calls earning to give? Why would you really try to maximize the, uh, your ability to be an earner is really strong that if, if you're truly um, invested in the idea of wanting to do good, when you have the opportunity to do so with financial resources, you can maximize your impact and really you know, focus on the very best charitable interventions and do a ton of good in that way. Um, I'll get to the second piece of how do you think about optimizing your time, but are there any questions or kind of thoughts or comments on earning to give? the idea of really just trying to build your company as, yeah, go ahead, Tamina. I have a question about, um, I'm looking at your website and it says investors can also make pledges. So if yep. you are an angel investor, um, you are eligible with the equity investment you've made to contribute a pledge? Exactly, yes. So we have, there's two ways that investors can take the founder's pledge. So we have a venture pledge. Um, so there's there are a whole bunch of pledging options. I didn't, you know, I didn't get into all the details of them, but. There's the option to take a venture pledge, which is on carried interest. And then for angel investors, you're pledging on the equity you hold in whatever company or companies that you want to pledge on. Great, so you're kind of hitting the startup ecosystem from both sides. <laughs> exactly, yep. Okay. Cool. And not only founders, but early employees. Um, and we have, a, I'll tell you later about another pledge too, that's for anyone in a company. So that if you're thinking about the entirety of your kind of uh, journey from, starting a company towards exit options also to really help you okay. amplify your impact. So, so I have a question. So mm -hmm. it seems like you're hitting the, the like venture-based startup ecosystem from both the entrepreneur and adventure side. Um, but what about the actual philanthropic or the nonprofit side, right? Like there's, you know, obviously like entrepreneurs in that world as well. Yep. Um, like how do you think about, you know, giving to early stage initiatives versus later ones, which are obviously more likely to be proven effective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so broadly in, you know, I can, I can talk about how do we recommend our charities broadly? And there's a lot of kind of detail of how from the, there's literally 10 million charities that exist. How do you narrow that universe for people who want to do good to the stuff that is the highest potential impact? Um, there's a way to do that that is based entirely on uh, the evidence base that exists and that would exclude new innovation because if you're only looking at is there a strong track, rec track record that this thing works are there rcts uh, you're not thinking ahead to what are the things that we don't know about yet or what are the new initiatives that will actually do things better than existing initiatives um, so founders pledge you know looks at all of the possibilities through several different lenses including evidence base but we do actually have a whole portfolio of recommendations in uh, seating startups in the social change and looking for the ones that really could be kind of highest impact initiatives um, that you're essentially taking a higher risk bet on because there's not yet a strong uh, evidence base, but you have to really believe that this thing needs to exist and that it will have a, uh, you know, yield higher returns by taking that risk to society. Let's see a question from Aviv. Yeah, Aviv, I can send that or follow up afterwards as well. I'm gonna to try to not be clicking on too many things. Sorry about the sirens out my window. Um, okay, so then on the other side of that, we have the the kind of domain expert side of our community. And yeah. this is this is probably outside of your scope as a uh, founder's pledge a little bit, but what are some resources for people that, you know, have no intention to be a founder, um, but still want to get involved in EA or in social yeah. impact in general? Yeah, so a couple of things I'll recommend. Um, so one is called 80,000 Hours. 80,000 Hours is a website. It's also a podcast that really thinks thoughtfully about how do you use your time to the, the maximal good. Um, so 80,000 Hours is based on an average lifespan. People will work for 80,000 hours. And what can you actually do with that amount of time? 
Um, it's again, part of the same philosophical movement. So it is taking a, a evidence basis to helping you assess trade-offs between causes you might choose to focus on or ways that you spend your time to the maximal good. Um, so that would be my top recommendation. More broadly in effective altruism, if you're interested in, in learning more about this philosophical movement and the many people who contribute thinking to it, um, you can check out, the, there's a website called Effective Altruism that is the, the kind of hub for the, the broader philosophical movement. And they list a ton of different resources for how you can either dabble or go deeply into effective altruism as well. Um, you know, in the Founders Pledge community, so we organize by cause area. So if, you know, if there's anyone who already knows they're interested in a specific cause and they'd like to have specific recommendations for say climate change, we have a cohort at Founders Pledge that's just focused on climate change. Anyone at Founders Pledge who is doing, who is either founding companies related to climate change, doing investing related to climate change or making philanthropic investments are part of that same community. And we find that basically just connecting with others who share that interest can really create opportunities for more collaboration that can lead in a variety of avenues. Um, so, you know, again, if you're, you already know you're, you have a strong inkling in a specific direction, I'd be happy to share any, you know, specific resources I've come across that could be useful to you. And then my last question before I just turn it over to kind of open floor is, um, maybe tell us more about the, the effective altruism community in general. So say, you know, I don't have a, a specific intention to make a pledge or, change my career. I just want to, you know, kind of get to know some other people thinking about this, get involved in the community. What, what are avenues for that? Um, where do these people meet up? You know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So several things. So one, I'd say, uh, if you like to podcast, there's some really great podcasts that are aligned with effective altruism. So in the Vox portfolio, there's a program called Future Perfect that I really recommend. I believe it was their season two that was entirely focused on philanthropic philanthropy and social change. Um, but Future Perfect in general kind of covers EA topics quite broadly. They have a really wonderful podcast and also articles. Um, the 80,000 Hours I mentioned is also part of the, the kind of broader thought leadership of this movement. The two founders of effective altruism are moral philosophers, one based at Oxford, one based at Princeton. So Peter Singer at Princeton, and then at, at Oxford, it's Will McCaskill. Both of them have TED Talks, have you know, a variety of content you can engage with. One of the resources that we most recommend at Founders Pledge is Will McCaskill's book called Doing Good Better. Um, it's a really great just intro read to how do you think about uh, the, how to maximize good, particularly philanthropically. And then for community building, so Effective Altruism is a very grassroots community. So there's actually pockets all over the Bay Area. Um, I think you guys are mostly based in the Bay Area. So there's chapters in South Bay, there's chapters in San Francisco. It's a global movement as well. There's kind of two big annual convenings that take place in Europe and in San Francisco each year, global convenings. So check out that effectivealtruism.org site to learn more about you know, how that community gathers. Um, and essentially the effectivealtruism.org site is, is you know, intended for anyone. Um, and there's members of that community who are in academia, who are, you know, nonprofit workers who are at, at, in any kind of walk of life. And then there's sort of specialist communities. So Founders Pledge is a specialist community for those in tech um, who also want to maximize their impact. But you, you'll find other kind of specialist communities there as well. Um, and just another kind of pledge to mention within effective altruism. So if you are not a founder, investor, early employee, or you know, clearly in the tech ecosystem, but are interested in pledging to do the most good you can, there's a, another uh, effective altruist pledge called giving what we can. And giving what we can is a pledge to, to donate a, a, uh, at least 10% of your annual income to the highest impact charities you can. And so there, there is a whole kind of strain to effective altruism that is how can you live as like simply as you can in order to give as much as you can, knowing that dollars earned in, you know, in the West, the kind of salaries that we make are such multiples of kind of dollars earned elsewhere in the world that your dollars could have a huge impact on someone's life, you know, who is living in extreme poverty. So if that's, if that's intriguing to you of how can you really maximize your impact, check out that giving what you can site. 
um, they also have a cool tool where you can calculate how whatever percentage of your giving you want to do per year, um, you know, how many actual lives could this save if invested in an area like malaria or um, if invested in global poverty alleviation. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's just take questions now. Um, there's a couple in chat, but um, if anyone wants to jump in, go for it and I'll, I'll work the chat questions in as we have time. Okay. I see Sharon. Oh, sorry. I didn't, I'm sorry. I was reading her question, but then you said answer, ask them first. I have a quick question. Who supports the, the staff and all of the research that you guys do? Great. Are you question. able to disclose or is it anonymous? Yeah. yeah, it's also, it's on our website. So not every single name, you know, some people choose to be anonymous, but Founders Pledge, uh, we're really grateful for a model where everything we offer is, is able to be at no cost to the people who take our pledge. Um, and that's because we're funded by a small number of, of large foundations. So Schmidt Futures, Open Philanthropy Project, which is Dustin Moskowitz's um, philanthropy, and then actually a number of our members as they have had liquidity events and have come into more success have chosen to fund Founders Pledge as a piece of their you know, giving. And so we are you know, entirely sustainable uh, with our members who choose voluntarily to, to donate to us as well as outside sources who underwrite our expenses. Maybe. Okay, one of, the, one of the chat questions was, um, kind of about, okay, so we could, we could have a startup that maximizes wealth generation and then give a portion of that to charity. But what if that in the process of generating that wealth, um, the startup, you know, damages communities or kind of does, does bad things that are extractive to the world. Maybe climate impact would be one obvious scenario. You know, if I wanted to start an oil company and then donate some of the earnings to altruism. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's, I'm going to point you to other, you know, other thinkers in, a, in addition. So you may have come across in the last couple of years, a book uh, called Winners Take All by Anand Girondas. Have any of you guys read that? Just looking at nods. I'm seeing at least one nod. It's a really interesting piece to, that asks this kind of philosophical question of, um, it's, it's really critical of philanthropy as a, you can go ahead and, and make your money any way you want with your left hand. And so long as you like take a little bit of it with your right hand and that's good stuff, then it, you know, it absolves all sins. Um, so it's a thoughtful and very critical book looking at our current economic system. I think there's some real truth to some of that, which is what happens when there's significant externalities in your day-to-day -day work um, that cause a lot of damage to society. Um, there's, you can take a, a pretty quantitative approach to, to being hyper-rational to answer this question. So you could, depending on, you know, is, is it actually an oil example or what you're thinking about, but you could actually model the externality that has been created with your company and then think thoughtfully about what is the potential for, you know, the, the philanthropic investments that you would make um, to come to a conclusion about, you know, is it better that I go ahead and continue to do this thing, knowing that it can, the proceeds could generate a ton of good on the other side, um, or actually have you kind of tipped the balance to where it's not, uh, the company itself is creating more damage. So that's like a hyper-rationalist way to address it. In general, I just say, yeah, definitely an important question to be asking, you know, check out some, uh, some additional resources. I think Anand's book, while very critical, is a really interesting read for people who are interested in kind of delving more into these moral dilemmas around how society generates value right now and what to do with your resources. Cool, Kathy, do you wanna ask the question that you put in chat? Yeah, this is in some ways kind of a consideration, uh, continuation of a question I asked before, right? So it seems like the effect of altruism calculation makes it seem like, you know, earning to give is just the best way to make an impact because you can have a lot of money and pay a lot of people to do the work. But if everyone takes this path, then, you know, like where do the effect of entrepreneurs and operators in the charity side come from? Yep. And like, how great... do you think about cultivating talent in this sector? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I did talk more about that side. There's a whole other piece of the movement that is about how do you put, you know, how do you, those who are really motivated to be great talent in this sector, how do you put your energies against the things that are really going to have the most impact? So that's the whole kind of 80,000 hour side of things. Um, so aligning your talents, 
skills, experience with really high impact ways to invest your time. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I didn't talk quite as much about that. I think it is equally as important that we figure out how to put top talent up against social problems. And there are, you know, there are many resources that exist to support that as well. Um, in cultivating talent, was that more of your question of how do we cultivate and mentor and support entrepreneurs in the social change space? Um, yeah, I think my question is more around like, you know, like how thoughtful are, are you when it comes to kind of uh, the ecosystem you're creating with the Founders Pledge and whether or not you're incentivizing people, right, to, who are actually effective to go into the charity space? Um, like how easy are you make, making it for those people to either get funding or to get started um, versus, you know, this as really just like an outlet for entrepreneurs to kind of like um, make impact part of their journey? Um, and it's like really supporting the entrepreneurs and the investors. Yeah, so our mission is, is definitely more geared towards we're, we're here to support the entrepreneurs and investors to give as effectively as possible. You know, that is our mission, empower entrepreneurs to do immense good and we do it through philanthropy right now. Um, as far as the broader ecosystem, you know, ho I hope that we are really helpful and friendly players that also help to ensure that people who are inspired to use their time to do good are set up with a lot of opportunities to do so and support to do so. Um, so we do have some partnerships within Founders Pledge that help us do that piece better, even though that's not the core piece of our mission and work. Um, and one example is our partnership with Schmidt Futures. So within the broader philanthropic ecosystem, Schmidt Futures has really, because of Eric Schmidt's kind of experience in thinking that, that talent is the biggest differentiator and whether you're going to solve a business problem really well or any kind of social problem really well, they have invested in trying to support the philanthropy ecosystem and finding top talent, including in tech, to uh, support and connecting with the biggest social problems of the day. So there's several points in which Founders Pledge has identified discrete projects that we collaborate with them and others to help our community, many of whom you know, end up being exited and having time on their hands too, uh, to connect with opportunities to volunteer, to co-create you know, initiatives, that are in the social sector. So again, it's a little outside of, you know, our niche is the philanthropy, but yes, there's absolutely a role to play in the broader ecosystem. Um, some other players who that's their sole focus and they're doing it really well also. Do you see follow-on pledges from founders? Meaning, you know, if, if uh, I co-found something are you seeing, because I make the pledge, lots of my colleagues and or employees and or co-founders are doing the same? Yep. So that's a great question. And uh, one of the things I didn't mention in kind of the, the pledges we have is actually this last year, we launched a new pledge with Airbnb that is focused not only on the founders taking the pledge, which has been our traditional model, founders and early employees, but actually opens up to any company that's having an exit event, the ability for anyone in that company, as well as their investors to join them in taking a pledge to, to, to give to charity from the exit proceeds. So now we have an option that's for, from you know, an admin who's been there for a week to the earliest employees, including the founders to pledge. Um, in general, and how Founders Pledge has grown, it's been almost entirely through word of mouth. So a founder joins us and they tell their co-founders and we have a team that helps support to make it easy to kind of onboard new members, um, but it's very much a, a uh, people who want to help change the culture in tech to have giving be part of the conversation. Um, so I'm actually curious to learn a bit, bit more about your journey from sort of what it seems like more establishment nonprofit world and maybe I guess in the UK, if, if I understood correctly, or um, and then to sort of this EA thing that is that I mean, I, I've been following it for, you know, 10 years or so on and off, um, the sort of emergence from other communities. And it's, it started as a very fringe thing, and I guess it's become a lot more mainstream. But yeah, I'm curious to sort of hear, you know, your, like, yeah, about that journey for you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Okay, I'll share just a, a simple story that I think is illustrative. Um, so after I left university, I, uh, you know, was working as a frontline humanitarian. And as it goes and you're entering this field. I actually, I had pretty great backers. This was through the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. I had a good amount of funding. Um, and I was working on projects that were with some of the kind of lead, let's say children's non nonprofits that work on disaster and emergency response. 
Um, and even with all of that kind of backing and support, when you're working in the day-to-day -day of seeing what are the projects that are being done on the ground, it was easy, you know, extremely easy to see what are some of the flaws in the system. So a very simple story is I worked with child soldiers in Northern Uganda and South Sudan. Um, there was a program that was being replicated all over the region in Congo, North, you know, Uganda, South Sudan, that was trying to rehabilitate child soldiers um, by teaching them a set of job skills. And the job skills you had to choose from were you could become a, uh, you could learn computer skills, you could become a cook or uh, let's see, computer skills, cook, an auto mechanic, uh, or a tailor. And then these kids would go home to their villages, um, where now it's a village of, say, 20 people, and there's five tailors. Um, they receive computer skills, but there's no power in the entire region, and there won't be power for 10 years. And it's funny in a way, but it's not funny when actually millions and millions of dollars had flowed all over the region to replicate this exact same program. Um, and there was a key design flaw. And that money was, you know, largely, and I'm not trying to be hypercritical, but it's largely money flowing from the West, you know, seeing something that feels good, sounds good, but the actual outcomes at the end of the day, when, you know, if you're the humanitarian implementing that too, is you're seeing these kids essentially being educated for something that they're never gonna use. And that's pretty heartbreaking. Um, so I, there was a bunch of examples I could go through for years of, of my career and the front line too, of just seeing that the good intentions that people have, they're genuinely really good intentions. I know the person, you know, the people who are making those decisions to fund that program had all really wanted a, a good outcome for those kids. Um, but there were a lot of challenges in, in how it was actually designed. So the thing that appeals to me about effective altruism is that it's not, nonprofits very often measure outputs. So an education charity might tell you, uh, the number of kids who are involved in the program or the number of books in their library. But if they're measuring the number of books, they're not telling you, is, has literacy actually improved because this library existed? Um, if, if they're measuring butts and seats, you know, are kids actually having a quality education that helps them enter the, the job market or have more fulfilling lives? And so effective altruism is really focused on those, the outcomes rather than the outputs. And and, you know, hopefully, while well, yes, it, it definitely started as kind of a fringe thing, we're hoping that it helps charities also think more critically about uh, measuring what matters. So one, one, I think, common critique of effective altruism, maybe from people outside the community, so maybe it's not a fair critique, but it, with the focus on being effective and, and measuring outcomes, um, it seems like it's awfully hard to work on things that are very hard to measure outcomes. So the common EA successes are um, maybe education or health, you know, global health or feeding, things where you can do something and in a short term, a few years later, see an outcome and do a RCT on these outcomes and be like, yes, we did this thing and there was this outcome. Um, but there's a lot of super potentially high leverage things in the world that really, very, very hard to measure such an outcome. For example, um, thinking about politics or democracy or governance, you could do an intervention. And I, I have no idea how you'd measure if that was successful. Um, so how do you guys think about things that are really hard to measure? Or do you just say our niche is going to be things that are measurable and we'll let other nonprofits focus on the, the harder to measure things? So we, we definitely try to measure all of the things. Um, so there's, you know, you can use a similar framework that gets nuanced uh, according to you know, what the problem is you're trying to solve to determine is it a better, you know, is it a better use of your time, money uh, to focus on a policy intervention versus anything else. Um, the policy in general, we think policy and governance are really high impact ways to have an impact. Uh, they're higher risk. So what we try to educate on is just helping you understand the trade-offs. So we will recommend to our members a number of policy initiatives that are, that are actually the highest impact things you can do, including politics. So just a very quick example, and it's you know, kind of the obvious, if you're interested in climate change, you could write a check to a variety of nonprofits that are doing good work to address climate change. Um, but if we continued having the, the president that we had most recently, um, the, the global climate agenda was pretty stalled. And the most impactful thing you could actually do would be change the global climate agenda so that we have countries 
uh, able to act to address climate change. And so, you know, investing in politics in that case, if you can actually change political leadership for this issue, such that you have leaders in place who believe that climate change is something important to address. And then next, think about the policies that are going to change the game. Um, you know, charity is definitely not always the right answer. And we apply like a, a you know, critical lens to consider all the levers you have. Um, I think it's a little bit of a misconception too that effective altruism is like just the easy to measure stuff. In the recent years, the movement has, has shifted to have uh, much more of a comprehensive look at hypothetical things. So there's, there's been a big shift towards the long-term future as an example, um, pandemic preparedness, AI security, uh, you know, what would happen if the earth became uninhabitable. So some like more esoteric kind of things as well. Um, but definitely those who are trying to apply a rational kind of lens to things are able to do that across a whole wide variety of cause areas. Um, and will, you know, will lead to outcomes of, yes, we think this thing is a good idea because it has a large scale of those who are impacted or a large, uh, you know, uh, has a strong evidence or a strong rationale for why it re really could make a big difference. I have a, I have question. a question. Oh, go ahead, Noah. Um, so on the spectrum of like companies that might have bad externalities, maybe they're neutral, maybe they're positive for the world, it would, I guess, be optimal from an impact perspective to make a lot of money and then donate it, as well as have the thing you're working on building also being beneficial, of course, where there's more people building Tesla type companies rather than things that are neutral to negative. Obviously, this would be good. Do you have any frameworks to think about? I guess here's a major problem, say climate change. And here is a way of having a profitable enterprise that's addressing this uh, important thing. Seems like it's super high leverage to, you know, have the profit of the company align with this because then, you know, maybe tens of thousands of people and hundreds of billions of dollars of capital will be allocated towards it. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, in general, um, and this is like, you know, this is a bit outside of my founder's pledge, you know, view, but in general, I and, and the leaders of Founders Pledge believe that companies that do good things for the world are also going to be the companies that will be the most successful in the next 10, you know, and more years. Um, and that aligning values with profit is, is the best way to go for society. And there's plenty of examples we can point to of companies that their fatal flaw has been not having a view of kind of all the stakeholders involved in their products. So um, you know, I, I continue to think that's true. The, um, and I want to nuance one thing before getting to the, the crux of your question, which is in the, the, the idea that one can earn a lot of money and then give it away. And that could be a, a very impactful thing to do. Actually, we would be a little more nuanced than that and say, you could earn a lot of money and give it all away and do nothing, like do achieve very little. And that's the whole reason that high impact philanthropy matters is because actually a lot of the philanthropy that happens doesn't achieve, uh, it doesn't dramatically move the needle. So you could donate a ton and, and do very little. And we'd, we'd much rather see people, if you're going to go ahead and make a lot of money and give it, you know, try and give it in a way that has a lot of impact um, and be really thoughtful about it. In terms of a, a climate change company that uh, what is a structure, let me, hear your question one more time. So what is the structure of a climate change company that can have the greatest um, impact? How do you think about aligning the incentives of the company with the good uh, that you want to provide? I guess part of this could be, I don't know if like B Corp or other uh, structures would make sense, things about measuring the outcome and aligning incentives broadly. Yeah. And if you guys don't do that, who does do that? Yeah, it's a great question. It is not what we do, um, but I'll tell you what I know about it um, or what I've learned from others who are focused on it. So B Corp is an option from, we have a number of Founders Pledge companies that are B Corp also. Um, from what I've heard from them, it is a pretty labor intensive process to be, become named a B Corp and then to maintain being a B Corp. Um, so the administration of it can be a burden to some who actually are doing all the right things and similar things, but actually, you know, uh, becoming a B Corp can be difficult to achieve and sustain. More broadly, for those who are really interested in changing the whole game of how is business done, um, you know, 
from what I've heard that one of the biggest barriers is actually regulatory um, in, in what our US kind of tax laws allow and don't allow. And so people who are really passionate about changing how businesses are structured have chosen to invest actually now in policy and trying to change policy such that we can have more innovative structures um, because there's a fairly limited amount right now that exists that could really uh, revolutionize the way business is done. And I think most people are trying to tinker within the system. And so things like a B Corp, you know, allow you to be part of the system and, and make it a little better, but it's not a totally different way to do business. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like EA pretty much provides a stack rank of here's the best thing, here's the second best thing. Do people kind of give you money and say allocate it optimally and then you do that? Or do they provide like, oh, but I really care about this disease or how much tweaking is there? How much room is there for like non-optimal but emotionally aligned allocation? Yeah, there's a ton of room. So you can okay. join Founders Pledge and, and not seek our advice at all on giving. Um, we hope that's not the case. And we try to invite people who like wanna be a part of having more impact, um, but there's no mandate to, to follow any of our advice. Um, then our approach is actually, it's very much heart and head. So one of the challenges with effective altruism has been it's extremely head and it, does, it misses the point that actually people need to feel connected to their giving. Um, and we want them to, to receive the endorphins and you know everything that happens that makes you want to keep doing it. If you take that away, you're missing the, the whole point. Um, so the, our Founders Pledge approach is very much values led. So we usually start with our members to discover uh, not just the issues they care about, but beneath, if, if you say you care about educating girls in a certain region, why? Um, is it because it's a justice issue for you? You know, what's the underlying grievance you have that makes you care about that issue? And once you really understand your whys, your values, we're able to open up a whole new world you know, with you of the things you knew you cared about as well as things you might not have known. Um, and what's important to us philosophically about that is you know, as the economy, wealth is, is concentrated in very few hands that largely look like folks in this room that are in the region, you know, the region in which we live. And we have a shared, you know, somewhat shared life experience that means that we haven't seen everything that exists out there. And so part of the, the bridge that Founders Pledge is trying to build is meet people where they are, um, help them see more of the world and take them on a journey. But that includes uh, also helping them optimize their impact in categories that are not at all traditionally effective altruist. So we will make recommendations you know, on a whole bunch of areas that's still applying the science of everything we've learned about how can you do more good um, to issues that people care about that are not the, the optimal impact. Um, and then we have, our, we do have funds and we do have charity recommendations that for some people they'll outsource all their giving and ask us to you know, optimize for impact and we can do that. But for many people, they choose to have a balanced portfolio. And so they'll tell us, you know, I wanna optimize my impact for 50% or 60% of my giving. And then 40% is kind of friends and family or causes I already knew about um, and we'll work within whatever constraints they have. Do you guys plan to take any stances on negative emissions technologies? We have a climate forum here and we've been looking at Stripe's policy, uh, both of investing their own funds, but also creating a platform. Are you guys planning any investigation there? Um, let me check in on that. I have not been as involved in our climate work, um, but I will ask and I'll revert back to Zach and he'll let you know. We do have a number of stripes in our community who are also involved in our climate work. So I know it's been hot on the agenda. I just haven't been as informed about that. Cool, Before thank you. Uh, I'm curious just to learn what about, what specifically day-to-day -day you are um, involved in and- Sorry, say it again, what specific? Oh, like uh, what your, like what is your main sort of day-to-day -day focus sort of in the role that you're in, that you have? Oh. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that at the outset. Um, so my title is managing director. I oversee kind of two pieces of the Founders Pledge business. So we have a CEO who's based uh, in- froze. Not sure if you heard oh. me. I did, am I here still? Yeah, you're good. You yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. for everyone else, not for me. <laughs> okay, sorry guys. 
Um, so we have a, a founder CEO who's based in London, and then I oversee kind of two pieces of our, our business. So our growth, so how we welcome new people to our community and also the business of Founders Pledge. So how do we make ourselves a sustainable enterprise as well? Um, and that's, that's kind of the two pieces of my role. The new pledge that I mentioned that's kind of end to end for any employee, investor, founder, uh, it's called Equity for Impact. And that's also been something that I kind of launched and have been incubating. So that's a, another piece of the Founders Pledge kind of org that I oversee. I have a question. Um, I guess within the US, it probably um, comes across as self-evident that um, you know, people making billions of dollars and then choosing where to allocate it is kind of the, the reward that you get from the, the free market. But in a lot of other places, it's more of a sort of collective choice where there's like, you know, maybe it's the role of the public sector. Um, do you think that, I guess, implicitly, um, that money can be better, more optimally allocated by the private sector? And I don't know, what are your thoughts on that general topic? Okay, so I'm, I'm again just speaking for myself and my kind of views on this, but um, it's a, that's another really important philosophical question about philanthropy overall. So the, one of the resources I mentioned at the outset, Future Perfect, that season two podcast is entirely about what are all the ethical dilemmas about philanthropy, um, and they cover this topic quite well. There's someone they interview on there who's an advisor to Founders Pledge and a close friend called uh, Rob Reich. He's a professor at Stanford. Um, he wrote a book called Just Giving that is entirely about, well, the challenges of philanthropy and particularly is it anti-democratic? I think there's a really strong case to be made for yes, it's very anti-democratic. It's essentially, um, you know, especially the tax incentivization. So what his book also does, it explains how did we even get here that we offer, uh, you know, massive tax relief to arguably those in society who need it the least. Um, and it enables them to, you know, have even more control of directing capital uh, instead of the government, which is, you know, essentially the government is a place that's meant to be making optimal decisions for our society. So it's a big question. Um, the way we're at Founders Pledge try again, try to approach these questions rationally, where it comes up most for us is members saying, should I try to optimize my tax deduction, you know, and there's ways to do that with instead of say donating cash, you're donating actual shares that actually, you know, that's a much more optimized tax way of doing philanthropy, or should they give more to, to the government by doing more tax? And if you want to have a really rationalist conversation about that, our advisors, you know, can talk through that question. The, the gist of it is essentially, if, if, again, if you don't, if you're going to do philanthropy and not be really thoughtful about impact, our general steer would be like, please give your money in taxes. Um, because you're actually not going to be doing more good uh, with something that is being offset by society through tax deduction. If you're going to be really thoughtful about your impact, arguably, you might be able to do more good on a specific issue or, you know, there's constraints within a society that would mean that the government might not be the best place to send your money. Um, and you could get pretty deep into answering that question of, is it better, you know, for you to make a specific philanthropic investment versus, you know, saving on tax that could have you know, maybe or maybe not been more optimally spent by the government for social benefit. Thank you. Those are great questions and very philosophical. <laughs> All righty. Well, I meant to save a block of time to kind of have a, a SPC internal discussion about um, kind of where can we go as a community and thinking about this stuff but we had too many questions, which was great. Um, so we'll push that off. And um, Tamina and I have been talking about, and some other people have been talking about um, having an unconference on February 17th, which I think is two Wednesdays from now, um, to kind of continue this conversation and, and yeah, see where to go from here. So if this was interesting, we'd love to see you there. And thank you so much for joining us today, Danielle. Uh, this was an awesome conversation. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. For, you. For Be coming. in touch if you have, if you want to follow up about anything. Thank you. Bye guys. Danielle, how can we reach you? Um, I 
I think Zach can send my email. I can also put okay, it perfect. in chat or feel free to find me on LinkedIn, all the, all the venues. Very cool. Bye everyone. I'll, I'll put it in Slack too. Okay, Thanks, guys. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Zach, for setting this up. This was awesome. And Ashley, too. Totally. Was Ashley really set it up. I was just like, let's do it. Awesome. <laughs> and then Ashley did all the work as usual. No, it was wonderful. Thank you, Zach, for moderating. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, guys.